Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to European Steel Day 2019, where our theme for our discussions this afternoon will be transitioning to the future of EU industry. My name is Jackie Davis. I will have the privilege of moderating our discussions this afternoon, and we're going to have a couple of keynotes just to set the context for those discussions. And then we're going to have two panels, two totally interactive panels. We're going to talk broadly about the state of European industry in a time of geopolitical and economic uh, challenges, both industry more broadly and the steel sector in particular. And then we'll home in on the crucial issue at the moment of trade policy in a renewed EU industrial strategy, that referring to the EU's industrial policy strategy unveiled in 2017, where trade policy was one of the central elements. Uh, the Twitter hashtag, should you be moved to share with the outside world what you are hearing in here, and we do encourage you to do so, we would like you please uh, to use the hashtag SD2019. Um, but if you wish to ask a question later, so during our panels, totally interactive as I say, I will have some questions for our panel, then I will come amongst you with the microphone. If you wish to ask a question or make a comment, could I ask please that we do it in the old-fashioned way? You raise your hand and I will come to you with the mic. So now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to your host for this afternoon, Geert van Poelvoorde, President of Eurofair. Geert, thank you for having us, sir, and over to you. So, thank you, Jackie. All, all okay? So, I will start the drinking. I have to excuse me because I have just a press conference of one hour behind me. And you see, global warming is getting also in Brussels uh, an, a theme. By the way, some people tell me that global warming has advantage in the north, because in the north we will get the temperatures of the south of today. So, let me start, because we have a very um, important topic and very important topics to discuss today. First of all, thank you for being here um, in the Steel Day 2019. It will be, and I tell you, a very specific and special Steel Day. Um, we had also a discussion with the journalists at this moment. Um, you know that we are, at this moment, uh, in a very specific situation because we are facing very strong complexity of geopolitical, economical and environmental uh, challenges. And um, it's nothing more or less than about the challenges of today as they look like today, they have the potential of erasing the complete European steel industry. This is what we are talking about. On the other hand, these challenges can bring us a great opportunity if, if we embrace the change and use it to accelerate innovation and find new opportunities. The junction we are at, and this was a bit of a shock to the journalists also this afternoon, but the junction we are at today is what do we want? Do we want in Europe a Europe without steelmaking? Or do we want a Europe that is the world leader in modern steelmaking? This is the question we, as Europeans, politicians, Commission, should answer. Eurofair's manifesto covers four topics that are the key topics for the future, and I will talk about some of them. So, trade protectionism, the need to decarbonize, the need to support innovations, and the upscaling of the European workforce. But before we go into this, I want to give you some numbers which are important to understand the whole uh, concept. First of all, the economical challenge. We have seen now in Europe an economy that has been growing six years, six consecutive years of growth. This is good. And according to the European Commission, the economy will grow also this year and next year already in the forecast of 1.5%. Steel demand until now followed a similar pattern. We had growth of last year of 3.3%. 3 
This year, the news is not so positive. This year, we are talking about a contraction of 0.4%. So, the steel industry has particularly hit very hard this year. And I don't need to tell you that those numbers, which are just numbers, have very strong consequences. The announcements that have been made the last months on plant closures, big production reductions in the European uh, Union, and thousands of jobs that are at risk are a consequence of this. So how did we arrive there? We had a very strong year in 18, and the 17 year was not bad at all. So how can we come in 18 as a very strong steel year, and we are here together in June, six months later, and being confronted with already announced a lot of closures and a lot of um, reduction of production. So to explain this a bit, we have to go a bit back. So there is not one single trigger. And uh, I would say that as an overall picture, we are having a European self-made crisis. So when we want to get out, it has to be a European solution. Many of, of you know that we have sent a letter to the European institutions. The title of the letter, which was, by the way, signed by 45 CEOs of steel companies, was called Crisis in European Steel. And it explained, and let me take a bit back on this, what happened. So the starting point of everything is, again, is not changed, the overcapacity. We are talking about, still end of last year, an overcapacity of 425 million tonnes. This is a starting point. And you know that a big part of this overcapacity is still sitting in China. And I think you have seen the press today. Uh, in May, China reached again a production record, an all-time production record. So the capacity cuts have been done. Yes. Are they sufficient? No. By far not. Because of this overcapacity, protective measures are starting to happen. And this is exactly what the U.S. did. So the U.S. introduced tariffs, and this is the called Section 232 process. They introduced tariffs of 25% of all steel that is imported in the U.S. to protect its own steel industry. Now, this steel that went to the U.S. has to go somewhere. So this closing of the borders has contributed to more overcapacity. And this deal has become as deflected in other areas. And when you take a look at all the curves, and we made in Eurofair a lot of uh, analysis on this, two-thirds two -thirds of the steel imports in the U.S. that are now stopped land in Europe. So this has contributed, again, to the overcapacity, and for sure in Europe, to the felt overcapacity. There is another phenomenon which is contributing to this. This is Turkey. Our Turkish colleagues are confronted with a market, and you know Turkey is in a strong recession, a market that has the last two years contracted a lot. So there is a lot of demand reduced, almost 30% in two years in Turkey. Don't forget this, almost 30% in two years. And by coincidence, the European market, the US market was the major export market for the Turkish steel producers. So, when the Turkish colleagues see in their own demand collapsing, at the same moment seeing their U.S. export market being blocked, where do they go with their material? Well, to the closest neighbor, this is Europe. In 2018, there was a 12% rise of European imports. And this was already following a record year of 2017. The hot roll coil, which is a specific product for flat products, has been rising the imports with 37% since 2017. 37%. And 16% since last year on an annual basis. Now, then, there is another factor behind this sharp increase, safeguarding. WTO has no problem that in this kind of uh, situations where there is high deflection of protection measures somewhere else in the world, that a 
company, a continent, a region protects itself. And this is called the so-called safeguarding. So the European Commission has understood and defined last year, in July, provisional safeguarding, and then made the safeguarding in February this year final. The problem is that the safeguarding has failed completely in its objective for a large part of the industry. It is too weak. What happened? The safeguarding import level is calculated on 2015-2017 levels. The Commission has increased the quota with 5% in February. And in five days, five days' time from now on, in July, there is another 5% plant. So, how can you understand that I just mentioned the steel industry in Europe is contracting with 0.4%? When you increase in six month times your quota with 10%, this is just a further destruction of the own domestic industry. So, those figures just do not match. They just do not match. So it is clear, when we want to go through this and want to survive this, the safeguarding has to change. The imports that are coming in today and the unfair imports are a real risk for the survival of the domestic players. For a sector as ours with 320,000 people, and we heard in the press conference there that the indirect employment with all studies we have been doing in Eurofair is a factor seven on the 320,000 people. So it is just not right that a domestic industry is just strangulated because the safeguarding is not working. And when we say 320,000 people are threatened to lose their job plus the indirect employments, this looks very general, very unreal very abstract. However, suddenly what we see now is that the impact of employment when it is made local and suddenly companies start to announce job reductions of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people in one location, suddenly this becomes very real. And then suddenly you see that there is panic. Panic at the union level, panic at the political level, suddenly this number of 320,000, when you translate it into 1,000 concrete local employment reductions, this is not so anonymous anymore. This is an extremely serious matter and it is disappointing that in Europe the procedures take so long and lead to damage before something happens. The safeguard measures we are asking are completely legitimate under WTO rules. So why is there no reaction? Why are we just hearing statements that everybody is supporting the steel industry, but nothing is happening? Now let me turn to the second problem. This is the emission trading system. This is also connected to trade. I will come back and explain it later on because Normally we think about environment, climate. It is directly connected to trade. But let me first explain two main impacts of the ETS system today. First is the ETS system wants to incentivize innovation, which is good, and this should drastically reduce the CO2 emissions of the steel industry. We welcome this. We want to go this road. We are investing a lot to decarbonize. There are several routes for steel makers of decarbonization. But this takes time. The routes that we are producing now have been optimized during 100 years. You cannot expect that in five years we have fundamental research exchanging all of this. The actual steel making route is extremely efficient. So when you replace this, you need major innovative research projects. The funding of those projects should be defined. We cannot achieve this alone. This is impossible. The decarbonization cannot be done on our own. The second impact of the ETS is the carbon leakage. This is something we have been warning for years. So now, carbon leakage is a reality. It is happening today. 
And as many of you in this room know, the ETS system sets a benchmark for environmental performance that no single integrated plant can achieve with today's technology. So, thanks to the benchmark, of course, the European steel companies are innovating. This is good. But as the benchmark is not achievable, companies are obliged to buy more and more CO2 allowances to continue operating. Assuming, with a very simple calculation, assuming that the plant emits 1.8 ton of CO2 per ton of steel and the price is 25 euro for CO2, that means that your marginal production ton goes up with 45 euro per ton. So it's not about the average CO2 cost of an industry. It's about the marginal cost. The system simply does not work. It does not work for an industry that is exposed to global competition. In today's environment, you cannot produce a ton where you have 45 euro marginal cost increase. This additional ton is leading to losses or at least very low or no profitability. So compared to imports from countries where this ETS system is not working, European steelmakers have no chance to be competitive with those volumes. So logically, in response of this, European steel companies will reduce their steel output to the level of the free allowances. This is just a simple economical rule. And this accelerates when we are flooded by unfair imports. And here is the connection with trade I mentioned. When you have so many imports, such a high level of imports, and your marginal cost is 45 euro per ton higher, you just cannot produce it anymore. This is as simple as it is, and this is what is happening today. So when CO2 allowances will progressively reduce as they do under the ETS system, the steel industry will reduce accordingly. How can we stop this happening? Well, by creating a real competitive advantage of low carbon steel making. I believe this is the future we have in Europe. This is the opportunity we should take. The problem we have right now is not that we do not want to invest in low carbon steel making. The problem is that the reduction of CO2 allowances is happening faster than the low carbon steel making innovation will allow us to buy fewer CO2 allowances. So there is a clear risk that we will shrink the steel industry before the innovative projects kick in. And this dynamic is not recognized in the Commission. This is the major problem. It is critical for the European steel industry and even critical for the world. Here in Europe, we have the momentum and we have the knowledge to become a continent of low carbon steel makers. And I believe the global industry would ultimately follow our lead, reducing CO2 then also globally. So yes, there is a future for steel making in Europe. There is a future for steel making in Europe because without steel making, but taking a look at our supply chain, there would not be a future for European industry. And I don't think this is in the sense of what we want to do. So what do we need? What? Yes, I'm very brief. Absolutely. Cannot believe how brief I will be, Jack. <laughs> so, first of all, what do we ask? We are asking the protection of the steel industry against unfair imports. This means we need good anti-dumping structures and good safeguarding. Secondly, we are asking for an ETS system that works hand in hand with low carbon steel production. Since the innovation journey is expensive and long, in practice it means three things. First of all, an ETS system that doesn't reduce free allowances so fast that we avoid that the steel industry shrinks further. Secondly, sufficient funding possibilities for decarbonization. And thirdly, a protection against importers that do not have the CO2 cost. This means a kind of border adjustment mechanism to ensure that there is a level playing field between those producing in Europe and those producing outside of Europe. Reducing global emissions needs policies in place. 
that build a low carbon industry. This will force importers to improve their CO2 footprint as well, as well, as all steel that's sold in Europe should do. And this will ultimately help the CO2 footprint of the steel industry in the world. There is no border in the sky for CO2. So I hope that you have understood that there is a vision for the European steel industry, but we cannot realize it on our own. Europe has now to make up its mind. It has to decide where it wants to go. I have never met anybody who wants the steel industry and the industry in general to shrink. And I think we will hear this also today in the debates and in the panel discussions. But we need these words to become actions. We need these actions to take us on the right path. Because we will be judged on what is done and not what is said. And today I can end with what I said in the beginning. We have to make up our mind. Do we want a Europe without steel industry or do we want to have a steel industry which is a world leader in low carbon steel making? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Geert. Thank you so much. Thank you. So underlining there that the very future of this industry is at stake. And you talked, when you talked about the challenges and embracing change and the opportunities, you underlined several times the importance of investing in research and innovation. You said, we can't do it alone, uh, which is the perfect segue into our second opening speaker, Patrick Child, Deputy Director General in the Directorate General for Research and Industry in the European Commission. The Steel Industry Communication of 2016 underline the importance of supporting innovative technologies and solutions. So it's great to have you here, Patrick. Over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to be here, um, as Jackie has said, representing um, DG Research and Innovation from the Commission, where I think that uh, uh, we have a, a lot of very uh, constructive and uh, exciting opportunities ahead of us, um, and that I don't have to answer on behalf of my many colleagues whose work on other aspects uh, uh, have perhaps uh, you know, raised a certain number of questions. And so it's very a great pleasure for me to be here with you um, and to make uh, a few introductory remarks to what I'm sure is going to be a very rich uh, set of uh, discussions during the course of the afternoon uh, in this magnificent historic uh, venue. And I think it is a very sort of uh, uh, direct reminder that uh, the very origins of the uh, European uh, project, the European Union, are in the European coal and steel community. And research and innovation have been a thread running through the whole history uh, of the work that we'd, we've been doing. Of course, today, as uh, Gert has uh, so eloquently uh, presented, we are facing some extremely acute uh, challenges, uh, whether it's the challenges of sustainability and climate change, uh, the really fierce global competition in the sector, and also more broadly in our societies, democratic, demographic shifts and new political forces emerging. And the mission that you have set yourself and the theme of this uh, event uh, in the sort of working for the transition of the European steel industry, um, I think uh, has a, a very obvious common denominator in all these different challenges, which is the potential uh, force for good, the contribution that we can make working together uh, on a very proactive agenda for research and innovation. And I want to s talk briefly today um, really about three main um, uh, issues. Firstly, the really uh, direct imperative of responding to climate change. Secondly, the contribution that research and innovation can make to boosting the competitiveness of the steel sector in Europe and the role that we see also for the European uh, Union to uh, work with you on achieving that. Uh, and thirdly, the place that the steel sector uh, can occupy in uh, making progress towards a global circular economy. So on my first message, I mean, I think there is no doubt that uh, climate ch change is real and it is uh, already exercising disruptive forces in our national economies. We cannot continue on a business-as-usual basis. 
Um, and we have seen strong signs of recognition across the economy, including in um, the sectors of uh, energy intensive heavy industry like steel uh, that, that we need to change and adapt. And I think that the, the challenge of um, uh, being a world leading uh, low carbon steel um, industry in Europe is one that I can certainly uh, immediately subscribe to. Um, and even if the European Union is uh, leading the global response to climate change, uh, we still see that in the European Union, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been still creeping up uh, in 2017 by 0.7% compared with 2016. And even though the steel sector has made significant efforts to reduce its emissions in the last year, and we really welcome that, steel production still accounts for 4.5% of greenhouse gas emissions and 215 of direct industrial greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that there is a very welcome growing awareness in the sector uh, that this is a, a, a challenge that we need to, to, to raise and address directly. Um, we in the European Union have committed ourselves to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% uh, by 2030. Uh, and to reach this target, we've, we've identified the two main pillars, energy efficiency and promoting uh, the production of renewable energy. Uh, and by 2030, therefore, uh, we will need to see half of the EU's electricity supply to be generated from renewables. And by 2050, uh, the Commission has uh, proposed full decarbonisation. And I think that uh, if we work together on those two uh, pillars, uh, that we can uh, significantly support the steel industry in your efforts to decarbonize. And so that brings me perhaps to my second message, which is the contribution that we can make through European funded research and innovation activities to boost the competitiveness of the EU uh, steel sector. And I should underline that we in the Commission uh, fully recognize the vital place that steel occupies in the EU, EU economy, um, and in its uh, broader contribution to employment uh, and to other related industrial sectors. Um, and, and we are acutely aware of the challenges and difficulties that your president has set out so eloquently uh, in his remarks uh, a moment ago. Um, and the dual challenge of remaining, competitiveness, remaining competitive and dealing with the pressures of uh, reducing greenhouse gases and climate change uh, uh, are, are very much understood uh, and shared in the Commission. Our priority is indeed to put in place a combination of defensive mechanisms against unfair international trade practices uh, and to offer developing innovative solutions uh, that in the long-term perspective will help the industry to become more competitive and resilient while relieving the pressure on our resources and on the environment. And in this whole picture, innovation, I think, is a key opportunity. I'm thinking, for example, about the hydrogen production from clean energy or the deployment of solutions based on carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and utilization technologies, long-term breakthrough technologies, as well as an integrated European approach will be fundamental as we seek to reduce the impacts on climate change and to lead international cooperation. Um, innovation obviously needs very significant investment and the European Commission is currently exploring ways of increasing synergies between the most relevant EU funding instruments. So of course, um, starting with the uh, Research and Innovation Framework Programme, Horizon 2020, and the future proposals for Horizon Europe that uh, we are working on, and I'll mention more in a minute, but also on instruments like the Research Fund uh, for Coal and Steel, where we are exploring ways of making more creative use of the, the money that is in that fund, um, or the Innovation Fund, uh, which is where uh, the uh, revenues generated from the emissions trading scheme are, are, are redeployed to productive use in the economy. And I believe that all these funding streams uh, will help us to support the uh, identification of breakthrough technologies towards low carbon steel making processes. 
Um, specifically on Horizon Europe, the, the next uh, framework program that we're working on, uh, in the coming days we will be launching a widespread uh, consultation on the strategic plans for the new program based on the political agreement that we were able to secure in record time earlier this year um, on the, uh, the legal texts. And we'll be holding a big series of conferences in September, uh, where I hope many of you will be present, uh, where we will get into the detail of what we want to do with the new uh, opportunities under, under, Horizon, under Horizon Europe. And I'll just finish with my third message um, on the place that uh, uh, we see the steel industry occupying in uh, the trend towards a global circular economy. This is an economy where value is maintained within a product so that when it reaches the end of its useful life, um, it can uh, at the same time reduce or eliminate waste. And in a well-structured circular economy, the steel industry, we believe, has a significant competitive advantage over competing materials. Steel is 100% recyclable and scrap is converted to the same or higher um, or lower grade steel, depending on the, um, the requirements of the uh, final product. Um, the European Union is a net exporter of scrap steel, and in 2017, uh, it increased by 13% compared with 2016. So just to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, climate change, we think, is the most immediate uh, challenge and priority uh, facing our economies and our societies, and I'm sure that uh, the whole question of climate change and um, uh, su uh, sustainability will be very high on the agenda of the new commission uh, that will come into office later in this year. Um, and we, we are ready and keen to work closely with the steel sector in the efforts that you are making to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to achieve the target of 80% reductions by 2050. Investing in research and innovation is a vital part of securing this low carbon future for the steel sector. With our proposals in Horizon Europe, we believe that we can make a very substantial contribution working in a very close partnership with you. Um, and I hope, therefore, that on the basis of the discussions that we'll be having during the course of this afternoon and the work that we're doing on developing and um, uh, deepening our ideas for, in particular, Horizon Europe, but also the other EU funding um, uh, instruments that will make a decisive contribution to an innovative and successful European steel sector looking forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Patrick. Thank you, and I'm sure your comments about the degree to which you are so acutely aware of the situation, that willingness to work together and some of the measures that you have outlined will be music to the ears of many in this room. We're going to come back and talk about all of those things. Uh, and just for some of our panelists who've just arrived, just to remind you uh, of where we started, uh, we're going in a moment to have our stakeholder round table and talk about the state of EU industry transition in a time of geopolitical and economic challenges. And just to remind you of Geert's words right at the beginning, that the very future of this industry is at stake. He said, these challenges that we face have the potential, and I quote, to erase the complete steel industry in Europe. But he also said it was a tremendous opportunity if we <laughs> embrace the change. But you underlined you can't do it alone. You need help. You underlined some of the areas from trade to the ETS, various issues where you need the help of the policymakers. So that message of working together very much endorsed by both our opening speakers. Thank you very much. Let me now bring up our panel, and please, panel, as I do, please do come and join me. Delighted to welcome Roland Barn, who is CEO of Utukumpu, uh, which is a global stainless steel manufacturer, Finland's largest. Uh, a very warm welcome to you. Please come and make yourself comfortable. Marcus Beira, Director General of Business Europe. It's good to have you with us uh, as well, Marcus. A very warm welcome. Doug Godden, Lead Economist at Oxford Econ Economics. A very well warm welcome to you, Doug. Maria Spiraki, MEP, a member in the last parliament of the Regional Development Committee uh, and a substitute member of the Industry Research and Energy Commi Committee. And last but not least, and Maria, I know you needed some water, and if any of the rest of you do, owing to the staging, it's a little bit difficult to give you water, but I have <laughs> supplies. Uh, so if you just go... I will give you uh, a glass of water. And last but not least, Luc Triangle, General Secretary of the Industrial European Trade Union. So, welcome to you all. 
Um, I, as I said earlier, I'm going to ask our panel some questions. I've asked them not to make opening statements, uh, and then I will come out to all of you with the microphone for your comments and your questions. Uh, and you can make a comment to what you're hearing. There is a lot of expertise in this room. We want to share it and discuss these challenges and opportunities together. I only ask that you are brief so I can get as many of you in as possible. Okay, so let us jump straight in. And I just want uh, to start, Roland, for you, I mean, Geert painted a very stark picture there of the state of the industry and the challenge ahead, and that balance of challenge and opportunity. How do you see it against this backdrop of these geopolitical and economic challenges we're talking about? Is it as grim as he says? Um, it can be. But if I may, first, uh, a little small correction. We are indeed the, the largest stainless steel producer in Finland, but it's not that difficult. We're the only one. <laughs> um, we are the largest stainless steel producer in the world by revenue. So um, we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think it's, um, it can be pretty grim if, not, if, the, if we not have the right policies in place by the policy makers, if we do not have the right environment created for us to move in, then it will be difficult. It's difficult today already um, with what we are facing today, let alone if you go into a more future look where decarbonization is an absolute must, but where you cannot force single uh, uh, in one area an industry to decarbonize with all the costs that come with it um, when you do not protect that industry to allow it to actually get to that position because ultimately if you don't do that then it's very simple um, the cost in the industry will go up it's 50 billion of investments plus a, a doubling of operating cost versus an asian producer that doesn't invest in it and it has no increase in, it, in, in, in their cost. So ultimately, your decarbonization will happen in Europe because we will close down, but you will have, as a world, um, a, a, a many-fold carbon footprint than you could have had. So, so the key challenge is, is, for your sector and other energy-intensive sectors, is getting that balance right. And at correct. the moment, a suggestion we're not. We'll come back to that in our discussion, if we might. But Marcus uh, Bearer from, from Business Europe, your broad perspective on the st all these geopolitical and economic challenges that we face right now, particularly impacting on this sector, um, particularly in relation to trade disputes and so on, but how do you see the overall picture? Are you broadly pessimistic or optimistic? Uh, and the challenges for a sector like steel, so important to our economy and under such pressure? Well, I mean, Jackie, you've been knowing me for a while. I'm, 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 I'm rather optimistic, but uh, as I sometimes tend to say, I tend to be an activist optimist. And uh, it will not be enough to be more optimistic. There's a lot of things we will need to do. I mean, there is some good news. I mean, we had a better quarter than we expected. So, so and we also expect the economy to pick up slightly next year. And there's a couple of good factors. But at the same time, there's a lot of challenging factors. I mean, of course, for steel, but I'll try to bring a little bit of a broader perspective. So number one, the world in which we have been successful, so the world in which we have strived with our model, is partly fading away with a more protectionist US, uh, with a more assertive and uh, more aggressive China. So we are about to find our new way in this changing world. And of course, this is a hell of a, ch a, hell of a challenge. I mean, there's some sectors we, we do well, at the same time, we also see that we are falling behind in, in, in many fields. And, and of course, this goes from, uh, from sectors which have been mentioned. But if you look at uh, just if you take the largest uh, companies in the world, top 10, top 15, whatever you, you call it, I mean, you, you will see that there's none of them is European, uh, very much driven by digitalization. Uh, and, and I know there's a lot of good things we have been doing. But at the same time, if you look at the bottom line, the truth is that we have been, uh, have been falling behind. Talking about energy and climate more specifically, I mean, you know that I think we all went a long way. Uh, and the debates we are having today is very different from the debates we would have had 10 or 15, five years ago. So, so people uh, also in our ranks very much agree with the goal to become carbon neutral. Uh, but then again, it will be very much about uh, uh, taking care of a number of preconditions. 
I mean, this means we will need huge investments, and of course, some of them will come from the private sector, but many incentives will need to come from public sector. We will need huge investments in infrastructure. We will need availability of uh, low-cost uh, green energy, which for the time being, I don't see. Uh, so there's still a lot to do there. Uh, and we will need to motivate the others. It's always the same. I mean, you, you know that as much as we are committed uh, to, to change, our share in the world by the year 2030 will be 5%. And if you look at last year, I mean, we have seen that there was a decline in Europe, there was a decline in Japan, and there was a steep increase in the US, there was a steep increase in India, there was a steep increase in China. Uh, and it, this is not here to, to, to go away. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is, uh, it's very good if we lead by example, and we are committed to this, but we will need to think about extra ways to also enforce our views, because otherwise uh, we will not come to a balance and we will not succeed. So you talked about Chinese assertiveness. Maybe we are going to need to be a little bit more assertive in the future. But also, question really for all of you a bit later is in terms of, in this changing world, has Europe really woken up to just how fast and how much it is changing and what the implications are, not just for steel, which we're already hearing about, but more broadly. Uh, but lots to come back to later. Doug, from your perspective and, and looking at the steel industry within the context of, of broader industry and how what it's going through compares with yeah. other sector, how do you see the overall um, state of play? Well, I think for steel industry, the, the sort of challenges facing manufacturing and EU manufacturing in general are sort of much more, they, they are magnified in, in the case of steel. Um, so, for example, steel is a very trade-intensive sector, and so any, any challenges in terms of costs or adverse trade policy developments, that will affect steel more than the typical manufacturing sector. It's also very energy-intensive, so anything that happens with energy costs and environmental policy, again, that will impact on steel more than a typical manufacturing uh, sector. And also there are some of the availability of substitute materials, perhaps aluminium, maybe some future developments in, in other alternative um, in other alternative materials, which could be a further challenge. And then finally, of course, you have got this existing problem we've heard about of the overcapacity in the, the steel sector. So I think there are some great challenges. And it's also true to know steel is, you, EU steel is relatively small in terms of employment, but it does have uh, three strengths. That firstly, the productivity, the output per person working in steel is very high relative to, our, relative to the economy as a whole and relative to um, other parts of manufacturing. Um, secondly, we've already heard how um, you know, it does have a very extensive uh, supply chain right across Europe. And in fact, you know, for every single job in the EU steel industry, there's another seven jobs which are supported as a result of supply chain impacts and the impact of uh, the spending of employees. Um, and then thirdly, and I think this is the other factor that our report launched today focuses on is how steel enables lots of other activities. If you think of important sectors such as vehicle manufacturing, uh, sort of mechanical machinery manufacturing, uh, metal products, everyday metal products, uh, and of course construction, without steel, there's certainly a good portion of that activity could not take place at all. You, know, you can't have a, a vehicle, very difficult to have, have a vehicle without metal sure. of some kind. Sure. And steal makes up a very uh, large proportion of the metals used in So in that those means industries. when we listen to its warnings about the state of the industry and the <coughs> fact that it is under such threat, it isn't just steel that's under threat, if steel's under threat, because of that enabling role no, that it that, plays that, in that's, so that's many right, sectors. Right. Come back again on that exactly. uh, if we might in our discussion. But thank you very much, Maria, from your perspective. Um, Optimistic, pessimistic about the state of European industry generally, um, and I, some, I know you were uh, running a little bit late because the traffic today is appalling, but I summed up for you the warnings that HIT was giving us about, about the industry. Do you share those concerns? Um, how do you see that balance of challenge and opportunity for our industry? Allow me to talk as a politician and yep, as an expert, but there are a lot of experts here in this room. To start with, uh, the problem that we face indeed is overcapacity for both of us, for the EU and the US. And instead of joint forces to address overcapacity, Donald Trump decided to play at the field of our competitors and to, to enhance the problem. This is the first. Secondly is the, the issue of tackling climate change. We all know that the climate change is a global threat. And we all know that uh, when Donald Trump decides to withdraw its country US from the Paris Agreement, then the level playing field is fully unfair. 
These are the two parameters that we have to face, and the level plate field is fully unfair, and we have to start working on this. How can we manage it? We have, first of all, to start working on the issue of uh, the uncertainty of the economic sentences that these kind of movements are creating. The uncertainty is a key issue on this. And secondly, we have to find something that it is more and above and something that it is, it is something that in a global approach than ETS. I, allow me to speak frankly because I think that we have to, to revise, to review in a way or another ETS for a second time during this mandate. But according to my opinion, emission trade system is now reaching its own limit. So we have to, to find something that it is more globally and more effective. And of course, not to undermine our competitiveness in order to start looking for, for, for cheaper energy, in order to start looking the, to the electrification of our steel industry and heavy industry, in order to start looking for the accelerators to have cheaper industry coming for renewables. Thank you very much. And, and, and that very much echoing, I mean, here was talking earlier about, he said, this is not working in terms of supporting a low carbon steel industry. It is really, it needs revising uh, fairly radically. You suggesting there something, come back to how dramatic that change has to be uh, to make it work and to make it deliver in a moment. But Luke, uh, complete the picture for us. Industry facing these stark, stark challenges, stark challenges for your members as well. Sure. Well, I think, first of all, we have to uh, understand that uh, European industry and European industrial policy and European politics cannot be disconnected from what's happening at global level. So we are not an island uh, at global level, so we must take into account what's happening at global level or what's not happening at global level. Uh, secondly, uh, it's clear that uh, Europe is good in making plans, but um, making them concrete into actions, sometimes there we fail. Don't forget that we had the ambition in 2010 to go to 20% um, of share of industry in, global, uh, in European GDP. Well, we didn't move any forward. We actually went back uh, on our percentage in GDP. Uh, and that all has led uh, also the economic and financial crisis until 2013-14 to a loss of 4 million jobs in industry over those years, eight years. We recovered a little bit in the last years, but still far beyond the level that we had in 2008. So, and actually, if you look to industry and to European industry, there are some major challenges ahead of us or where we already are in the middle. And actually, the steel industry is in the heart of that debate. And that's, for us, two major challenges. That's the whole issue related to climate and to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And that indeed means decarbonization, um, energy shift, um, and implementation of all these measures. Um, and secondly, it's the whole issue of digitalization. And all these two um, uh, main challenges will lead to a deep de transformation of a number of sectors. And steel is one of these sectors where, we'll, where we will have this, um, uh, this transformation. And in that sense, uh, we expect from European policymakers that they recognize the importance of steel. You cannot be ambitious on industrial policy. You cannot build a strong European industrial house without solid foundations. And one of these solid foundations that we absolutely need in Europe is steel. Uh, you can't be ambitious on industry for Europe if you say we will do it with imported steel. We need European steel. Uh, also in the future, and in that sense, what's going on today is not just uh, five minutes before 12, we're already beyond 12, we're already after 12, and now it's really a matter of uh, making the right choices for the future of the steel industry. I think that may Mr. Van Poelvoorder um, defined the, 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 the challenges very clearly, and I'm going to repeat them very short. First of all, um, we have seen an increase of imports. Uh, secondly, we see a decrease in European demand. Thirdly, we have this global overcapacity. Uh, up to one-fourth of, um, of production today in, in the world is overcapacity. Fourth, the um, EU measures uh, to safeguard steel are uh, absolutely not sufficient. They need to be strengthened. And fifth, uh, as I said, we are not an island. We are facing with high energy prices. We are faced with a carbon price which is five times higher, if I'm not mistaken, than early 2008, uh, 2018 than one year and a half, five times as high. So this all uh, is um, detrimental for the competitiveness of our European steel industry and absolutely as trade unions, we also want to have a clear European action here 
to safeguard the future of okay, European steel. Come back, on, come back on all these issues. Thank you uh, very much. In terms of that renewed industrial strategy, and Marcus, perhaps I could come to you first. I mean, it talk, the ambition that it set out to make sure that our industries can remain or become uh, world leaders in innovation, digitization, and decarbonization. Um, broadly, in terms of the industrial picture as a whole, do you think we're on the right track in Europe? Uh, there are some issues specific to the steel sector that we're raising, but overall, would you say uh, the European policy approach is the right one, um, or is it in desperate need of fixes to address some of these issues you've all raised? Well, first, I mean, I, I agree with many of the points Luke has raised, so, so, so this is important to underline. Second, uh, you asked the question earlier, have we woken up? I mean, yeah. I think we are about to wake up, uh, but of course, I mean, uh, speed will be of the essence. Uh, because as, as I said earlier, I mean, the world is changing rapidly. The truth is we, we had, and, and Lucas mentioned this target that we wanted to go, to go back to 20%, coming from the clear uh, conviction we have seen throughout the financial crisis that you cannot be successful without a sufficiently large and sufficiently competitive industrial base. Uh, and the target was there. Then I must say, uh, also at the beginning of this commission, the, the track has been lost a bit. So we had a couple of lost years. And since a while, we are understanding again that we need to go in this direction. So, so uh, and the issue is, of course, more needs to be done. I think now we are back to, to, to a level of understanding that we understand that we need to have a more strategic approach to industry policy, which was still questioned two, three years ago. Uh, but this alone will not, uh, will not uh, bring us a success. I mean, now we need to fill it with life. And there's a long list of things we will need to do. I mean, we, we talked about energy policy. Of course, we need to decarbonize. At the same time, we need to be sure that, that we, uh, we can still be competitive and we have the security of supply. Uh, it will very much depend on how we interpret trade policy and, and, and of course, uh, we all very much like the way we did in the old days, but as the world is changing, we'll also have to adapt to this. Uh, but finding our own model, not copying the Americans. Uh, uh, this is about, uh, of course, uh, innovation, research, R&D, as you, as you have rightly stressed, because uh, by 2030, we'll be the only oldest population in the world, so therefore we'll need to be more innovative than uh, other parts of the world, and not less. And if I look at the input figures, we, we continue to fall behind. So there is an enormous amount of things we need to do. But as you said earlier, I mean, I'm optimistic. I think if we do our homework, we have opportunities here. Uh, but uh, we will need to do it more rapidly and more assertive okay. uh, well, than in the last year. Do you year. feel, and I'd like to then come, come and get a political reaction to this, but do you feel Europe has woken up? to the scale of the challenge uh, and the way the world, that landscape is changing so dramatically, both broadly in terms of its approach to industrial policy and specifically for your sector. Do you detect a sense uh, the tectonic plates are beginning to shift and the reality, the stark reality is coming home or not quite yet? Let me think about it for a moment. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, uh, yes, the, the buzzwords are being used, innovation, digitalization, decarbonization, etc. And we want to do that um, by 2030, preferably. You have to design a broader thought around that, about how do you get there. You can't ask um, companies, industrial companies, to innovate, for instance, in our case, if you ha do not protect the profitability of these, these companies. If there's no return, if we're not making the cost of capital, how are we supposed to plunk billions of dollars in innovation, um, invest 50 billion in decarbonization just as an overnight charge, let alone the rest that has to happen. So if you on the one hand let the Asian products come in by the bucket um, at unfair priced, subsidized pricing, and on the other hand, you say to the industry, but you have your responsibility, we hold you to your responsibility, yeah. that doesn't work. So, no. Is the answer. Maria, from a political perspective and in the debates that you have about these issues in the European Parliament and more broadly, do you get a sense or do you feel a sense of urgency here? Because I think Marcus was saying, mm, rather slow start going in the right direction now, but not with the speed, not with the urgency, not with the fundamental shifts we need. What is your, your sense of the political mood and whether people have, to use his words, woken up? 
Well, I agree that the European Union is not doing a lot. But I think we are trying to do our best, taking into account all the, the agreements that we have already taken on board. And to start with, first of all, we need a very urgent and coherent industrial strategy. And we need to take uh, on board some, some kind of the recommendation or the proposals that uh, Europe First has already put on the table, like uh, creating clusters, like developing R&D, like etc. We have a huge amount of money on this issue. Starting with uh, Horizon Europe, it is the biggest package for R&D in the European history. And secondly, we have a lot of uh, financial instruments that we can have uh, available and we can, of course, create uh, specific platforms in order to, to melange, to, to have an, ad an additionality to, 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 this, to this funding. So I think that we have enough funding. We don't have enough results. And this is the case for, for the EU. And of course, I insist on this. We have to start, uh, to start putting pressures to our competitors with all manners that we have available. Starting with putting tariffs to, to the US issue, starting with uh, uh, being not so political correct. And starting to understand that by the end of the day, US domestic supply, for example, could not pick up the slack creating by tariffs, especially regarding special formulated steel for specific issues like aircraft funds or drilling uh, equipments. So we have to, to consider maybe in a, in a different manner. And why do you think we haven't been till now, just to quickly follow up on that? Why is it taking us a while to adjust? I mean, somebody was talking earlier about that assertiveness question and, and do we need to have a more assertive approach? But it's taking us a long time to get there. Yes, it is, it is the European way of doing things. We need time <laughs> and we have a procedure and we have to take into account the, the member states' opinion and the member yeah. states' implementation by the end of the day. So I think that the, not coming to, the, to, to Brussels but starting with our member states, starting from Athens, for example. Yeah. We have to have national pol politics in order to, to facilitate our industry and then go to Brussels. It is subsidiarity in our junk on And that takes time. I'm, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, Luke, and I'll come to you in a minute, Doug, because I'd like you to, to react uh, to all these different perspectives from stakeholders. But just in, in terms of this issue of the urgency to act, mm. you talked about that deep transformation that this sector mm. is undergoing. Uh, and we've heard from, from Patrick was saying, we feel your pain, if I can put it very simply. We're acutely aware. Do you agree, do you think they are now and understand what's happening to this sector? Um, and if they are, though, are they responding with the urgency we need? Well, yesterday we finished the work in the high-level roundtable Industry 2030. I'm also a member of that group. And I can assure you that it's clear that in the document that will be released in the upcoming days, the importance of the energy-intensive industries in a, in, in, yeah. in a broad sense, including steel, has been recognized and has been taken up. So that's clear. Secondly, um, the point is that indeed also the, point, the, the need for having a coherent industrial policy is also back on the table. It wasn't there for a while, but it's now back there. And what we now try to do with Vice President Kaitan and, and with his group is to bring it also indeed into the agenda of the next commission, if I may. But I think the word coherent is extremely important because what is industrial policy? Industrial policy is actually a combination of different kinds of policies. And that goes from investment policies to innovation, to research, to trade policies, to energy policies, to climate policies. And what we see and what we have seen too often is that what sometimes is done good there is then destroyed somewhere else. And I look a little bit to the way how we have dealt with trade policies in the last decade. I mean, yes, we are in favor of trade, but let's not be naive when we do trade We're with other parties. On, on we, we are 500 million citizens in the European Union. We have a strong economy. Well, we have to use that in making the right trade agreement yeah. and make sure that we are not faced with unfair import yeah. of all kinds of products in our European yeah. market. We're going to come back on the trade issue. We have a whole panel devoted yeah. to discussing precisely how to do that. But I'm very struck because when you looked at the industrial policy strategy of 2017, it talked about holistic. It talked yeah. about coherence. But you're calling for a coherent policy. Marcus, I think you want to make a point and then I want to come to Doug. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, on, on, on this directly, yes, we are calling for this. And, and as I said, 
the wording is going the right direction now again after a phase. I mean, we have been there in the previous commission, remember? Then there was years where this was forgotten and now we are back on the wording, but now we need to see the action and we will need to, we'll need to, see, to, to see much more. And, and one way to do is of, course, uh, is, of course, the strategic value chains. And this brings me to what you have been saying, the European way to do it. And I've seen that was miscontent in the room. And, and I partly agree because, of course, of course, a Chinese president saying what, what has to happen or a U.S. president what has to happen, I mean, this is going faster. This we won't have. But at the same time, it's, it's clear that we need to become more rapid, more assertive, and less bureaucratic. And, and this European where this, this uh, important... Uh, these important value chains of common European interest. Uh, I mean, this is a key example. I mean, we have one good example for the time being. It took four years to bring it to market. Okay, it was a first. But our argument is for the things to come now, we need to come much more rapid to having it in the market because otherwise it will not help. So, so the point I wanted to make, yes, of course, the European system is more complicated than others. And up to a certain extent, this will stay. But then within this uh, framework, we need to, to, to become as, as, as efficient, as rapid, as, as less bureaucratic as we can be, because otherwise we will simply not, uh, not prevail. Okay. Doug, uh, just on this point of, of coherence, um, to what extent do you think that the strategy that was laid out two years ago for industry as a whole, that steel communication strategy, a communication of 2016, which specified some very specific measures, most of which you've all mentioned, that need to be tackled. But have we got the joined up thinking we need? And if we haven't, what do we need to do? I suppose, just, first of all, I should uh, start by saying that Oxford Economics doesn't actually take a, any sort of policy positions as no, such. Indeed no, indeed, indeed. But, but my view... But just in terms yes, of what we know view, about yeah. what's happening. So my view of an economist, I think that the, the aspiration in the industrial strategy is a good one, you know, that we do, and, and we do need uh, an environment which is going to foster you know, investment, and investment not just in tangible assets, but also in, in uh, innovation and uh, in, in skills as well. And I think for manufacturing in general, the EU will be looking to move to become sort of the even more higher productivity uh, manufacturing uh, base. And so I think the aspiration is there, whether it is coherent or not, um, whether it's enough or whether enough is going on on the ground, um, I'll leave that to others to, to comment. Absolutely. I'm going to go out to the room and then I want to come back and, and draw some, discuss some of the implications of all this new team in town, uh, new parliament, uh, new commission president to be chosen, who knows when, uh, soon, Sunday, we Sunday, hope, on, on Sunday, Sunday in theory. Uh, I like your optimism. A new person to chair EU summits, a new council president, new central bank president, lots of new people in town. So what does all this mean and what message do you think should go out from this room and from other discussions like it to that leadership about what they need to do? Come back on ETS, come back on those issues. But before that, any questions to our panel or comments to what you are hearing? Does anybody want to join in the discussion at this point? Uh, or are you happy for me to go on grilling them? Let us have a look. No, I think for the moment, I see no hands up. I'll give you another a chance uh, in a little while. But Okay, let us come to some of the, we'll come back to the sort of broad implications for the new team. Um, but in terms of, let's come back to the ETS. Uh, and Maria, you called for, you said it needs to be more global, more effective. Heert in his opening remarks uh, said it simply isn't working to support uh, a low carbon steel industry. And we've heard similar comments uh, here from Roland Swan. What do we need to do to develop something that will work? I think that we have to raise awareness not only within EU, but outside the EU. And I think that it is time to take on board all the major actors that we have in, in, at the global level. It's not easy, but it is important to go ahead with this. Otherwise, we will face a lot of undermining our competitiveness. And this is a case that we have to tackle as soon as possible. So you want a pretty fundamental rethink? Yes, of course. I, we need a pretty fundamental rethink. But because you know how ETS is working now, we will go ahead for a revision. We have ambitious target, but having ambitious target in Europe, we have to take into account that we are not working in an island. We have to remain pioneers on tackling climate change, and at the same time, we have to, 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 to protect our competitiveness. And it's not easy to combine both of them. Just, I would like to say just two things on this. By, by 
encouraging and, and uh, in a way supporting our competitiveness. First is how can we manage artificial intelligence and digitization in our industry. And it is important to know that according to the World Economic Forum, it is estimated that by a shift of the division of labor, some of 75 million jobs may be displaced by 2022. And at the same time, 1.74 million jobs will be created. But we need a fast digitalization and we need a fast agenda on this and a fast shift to this. And second, it is the circular economy and the way that our industry could be a part of the circular chain. Which is part of that seizing of the opportunities that we've been talking about. Just in terms of ETS, are you, generally speaking, revisionists or revolutionaries? <laughs> <laughs> if I can put it that way. Roland, can it be revised and made to work or do we need to be more revolutionary? I think the issue is not so much the ETS system as such. But just ETS on its own will not work because carbon leakage is, is a factor. Yeah. So ETS could work if you embed it in a more um, holistic global view, like uh, border, border, CO2 border adjustments that basically force uh, importers onto the same, this, the same uh, level playing field. So uh, I'm not so much that you have to do something big on ETS because as long as you do something on ETS and you radically change it, but you still keep it on Europe, it will still not work. Yeah. You have to broaden the, 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 the view. Thank you. Marcus, you want to come in? Well, I mean, overall, we, we support the ETS system in principle because it's a market-driven system. So, so, so this one. And, and I also think it's wrong to say, uh, which is very often coming from NGO side, it's not working. You have seen a, a serious shift in, 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 in prices. So, so, so you can see that, that, that the signal is there. But the issue is, I mean, and I totally agree with Mr. Bard, that this will not be enough. The first, there's a number of preconditions we will have to, to find in Europe. Uh, I mean, for instance, our calculation means if we want to go to the target the Commission is now talking about, uh, we talk about the level of electrification which equals more or less 300 large-scale nuclear power plants until 2050. Uh, and, I mean, first, I mean, we'll certainly not build uh, 300 nuclear power plants, but we'll need to see where will the energy come from, where will the electricity come from. And this, I mean, this will, this will necessitate enormous investments, and, and, and therefore the, the, the incentives, the framework, all this will need to be there, because, of course, Mr. Baal mentioned it, you can incentivize, but you need to create the framework, and, and, and otherwise these investments uh, will not happen. Number two, the global. I mean, I've mentioned yeah. this. Of course, it's very important that we lead by example, but uh, we need to also make sure that the others are doing their share. Uh, again, we will be 5% in the year 2030. Uh, China is going up, India is going up, Russia is going up, and also the US is going uh, significantly up. So we are also saying, if the others are not living up to their, uh, to their uh, commitments, because uh, carbon leakage is a real issue and is, a, is not only a threat, it's happening, uh, then we need to think about ways how we can better enforce our views. Yeah. Is this border tax adjustment we need to see? I mean, we now have redefined our position saying we are ready to look into this, which has caused a big outcry uh, by many. But, but, I mean, there's also other possibilities. But the, the truth is we will need to think about what can we do uh, to not only lead by example if the others don't follow, but also to, to, enforce, to enforce our views, because otherwise it will not work. That assertiveness that we were talking about earlier. Any other comments to ETS? I then want to come to overcapacity in a moment. Um, just, I mean, just as a general broad point about you know, the whole environmental policy issue, it is essential that you really, the EU, EU, there's a limit to what the EU can do on its own, so it doesn't need to work, try and persuade other countries to have such similar systems. And of course, to the extent that those countries don't play the game, then the EU will have to you know, modify its policies to make sure that, that it it doesn't lose competitiveness. Yeah, so that, that issue, yeah, yeah, please, Luke. Very short, so we support as well the ETS system, but to the point where it's uh, going to lead to the to side effects which we cannot support, and that is indeed carbon leakage. So when it starts to lead to that, then we have reached the point where we cannot go any further. And second point uh, is that indeed we must find ways, also through trade agreements, how we can export our ETS system to other parts of the world and also forcing them to start to use this system that we have invented in Europe. So without that, 
uh, I, to be honest, I see also um, a risk for the long-term existence of our ETS system because it will not be sustainable if we are not able to export that to other parts of the world. Thank you, and I'll, I'll come back and I'll ask our second panel uh, to comment on that. I want to come to another issue that requires a global approach, the overcapacity issue, and we do have the Global Forum on Excess Steel Capacity. We'll come back to it as well, I hope, in our second discussion. But in terms of, of what we need to do, how effective do you think this Global Forum can be? Uh, it seems, looking at the outcome so far, I mean, you could say, well, it's great, at least we're talking, at least it's on the table. But a lot of it has been about information gathering, etc. Do you, what do we need to do to really tackle this overcapacity issue at root? Because uh, while we have it, and then we have a response like the US has, has made, as, as Geert was saying, and you go into protectionism, you're sort of on a vicious uh, cycle. So in terms of the excess capacity issue, what do we need to do? How can we really make sure that we address it effectively instead of just talking about it? Roland, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> do you have an easy question as well? <laughs> um, there are no easy questions, no easy questions. <laughs> unfortunately. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very sticky issue. If you look at, um, for instance, what has been agreed in uh, reduction in the past, the famous 250 million tons in China, they did close the 250 million tons, but they have reopened much more modern tons to compensate, so um, on balance, nothing has really happened. Uh, what can you do? Uh, the first thing, um, of course, is to make sure that the, the capacity that is being subsidized, that you find a mechanism of taking that out. Yeah. Now, no one will agree to that. That's the issue. So um, it is, it's very logical that this should not be there, so, um, uh, but no, no one will agree. In fact, what, what Trump did, and uh, I have to haste to say that I'm not a Trump fan, but it's probably one of the, the few semi-logic things he did, which is to say the only way you can do, uh, can control China, because that's basically the issue, let's call, call a spade a spade, is by making sure that all steel that comes into the US has a tax. Because otherwise, you put a tax on China, China will dump the stuff into Korea, and Korea will be the next one that exports into... into well, and what we've so seen indeed, the figures that were given earlier, two-thirds of those imports that would have correct. gone to the US are coming to the EU now. Uh, all, but even into the US you'll find a way. It's, it's, it's like water finding, always finding a way. So um, by, by, by putting a, a, a total protection around it, you address that. But it's a method that I would not want to support. I mean, it's, yeah. Ultimately, it's yeah. not something... So it's a very uh, sticky issue. The, the answer I have for you, I have absolutely no clue how you do that unless you have um, a, a clear understanding globally that it has to happen. Now, yeah. the, the one, the, and I get back to the same point, the one thing that might help is to tackle it through climate. Because at the moment that you, um, you first of all, you have targeted uh, anti-dumping against uh, unlevel climate, uh, uh, um, capacity, and secondly, you link it to um, the same carbon rules as the rest of the world, you will force a number of these players out over time, because they become uneconomical. So it's, I don't think you will get there negotiating, I think you will have to find um, a, a carrot and stick method. Look, of this, of course, of central importance to you, central importance to your, your members. We do have, in recognition of what a difficult challenge this is, uh, the EU does have various mechanisms at least to mitigate the impact mm -hmm. of reductions in capacity. I'm thinking about the Global Adjustment Fund, mm -hmm. European Social Funds, and so on. But do you think uh, enough is being done to help bring about that transformation and that reduction in capacity we will need within Europe uh, as well as more globally, um, because as Ron says, it's, it's a very tough nut to crack. Well, first of all, I would like to say that in the normal markets, um, uh, global overcapacity corrects itself. Uh, and it doesn't correct itself when the other um, yeah. uh, drivers are playing, like state aid, like subsidy. And that's happening today with the steel sector. So why do we still have 25%? Why it's still growing? Because there are other uh, non-market, um, normal market uh, measures playing uh, in, the, in the steel industry today. And we need to correct that if we want to tackle the global overcapacity in steel. That's first thing. Secondly, f we believe there is a, a huge social dimension here linked to the issue. Um, Geert van Poelvoorde already mentioned it. Um, 
closures of companies, and these are our members, these are companies that we organize, these are trade unions where we deal with. Um, so all these transformations um, on decarbonization, uh, on climate uh, measures and so on, we support them, but they will indeed, as I said before, deeply change the structure of certain sectors, starting with the steel industry. And if we want to have the social acceptance of our society, because I'm not talking only about the workers working in these companies, but also their families and communities which are depending on so those sectors. If we want to have the social acceptance, then we need to have a strong social agenda linked to these structural changes. If we don't have that, if we just ignore that, I'm afraid that we are facing difficult social years in Europe in the 10, 20 years ahead of us. And so in that sense, the social component, the social dimension, which goes into skills, which goes into regional funding, into um, regions that will be highly affected, some maybe not, but those regions which are highly affected and we know them very well, well, the question is, what do we do today to avoid that we have social turbulence in these regions in 10 years' time? Yeah. So those things are being done, but are they being done enough briefly? No. 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 We need more. Yeah, absolutely. We need more. Yeah. Maria, you raised this point at the beginning in relation, you know, um, um, Luke saying that, of course, market forces should deal with it, but for the re because of the behaviour of many countries, and you mentioned Donald Trump, it's not happening. What do we need to do? What can we do? First, we need fair trade agreements, and I insist on this. CETA is in force right now, and we have the products of this fair, fair trade agreement. We have a fair trade agreement EU-Japan, and we need a fair, fair trade agreement with China. And of course, you know that the TTIP is a synonymous with failure. So we have to work on this. And we have to work on this in order to, first of all, to to export our ETS system, secondly, to, to, to start working on our capacity from both sides. Secondly, we need a strong social support coming from MFF fundings and from other funds. That's why, as, 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 a, as, as an institution, the European Parliament has already uh, forwarded the Energy Just Transition Fund. It, uh, it is a proposal that it needs more than uh, 3 billion euros, 3.4 is our proposal, in order to facilitate people that are working in a, in a carbon uh, dependent regions, uh, there are 14 uh, within EU, and we are trying to, to, to explain to them that it is time to, to start reskilling themselves and it is time to invest on reskilling themselves, and we are trying nobody to leave behind. This is, this is our case. It's not for steel, but it is something that it is related to steel and it is core. And third, I think that we have to, to rethink the way that we are operating, not only in steel industry, but uh, in our own European industry as a whole. I insist on digitization and circular economy. And I think that in these two, two, two aspects, we have to, to work more, to focus more, and to, 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 to transform ourselves more rapidly. Which brings us to that other side of the coin, the embracing of change and the opportunities that Geert talked about right at the beginning. Marcus, quick one if you would. Why don't you just quickly then check if there are any more questions yeah. in the room and we'll draw conclusions. No, Marcus, well, first. I mean, on the overcapacity and the answers. I mean, obviously, I mean, we, we all suffer from the overcapacities in China, not only on steel, but very much on steel, but also on other uh, sectors, aluminium, semiconductors, and so on, and the U.S. reaction to this and all these things together put the pressure on Europe. So, I mean, I abstain from commenting in how far the U.S. president is, how did he call it, half rational, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, but I think, I think if, if some things might be half rational, I think in what he is not half rational is, is that he thinks that he will be able to change the Chinese behavior on its own which I don't believe in. And uh, at the same time, I think uh, also dealing very much with China and, and we are in a change process towards China as well and they will certainly have a more assertive stance towards China. Uh, but I think there is a certain readiness for certain changes, but only if the pressure is high enough and only if we are working together. And as much as we do on the trilateral, of course the Chinese will not take us serious as long as we pee on each other's shoes. Uh, what we are, what we are currently, what we are currently doing. Uh, another thing I think what can be done, of course. I mean, of course, we need to work via the WTO, which is very difficult at the moment because we rather try to keep it alive. Uh, we need to convince, on the one hand, the, the Americans that by getting the WTO right, this can help them with the issues they have with China, and to convince the Chinese 
that it's not enough to say we want to protect the WTO because system is fine for us, but they will need to give and also change their habits in order to keep it, in order to keep it alive because otherwise it won't. And last but not least, and I think very important what we, what we are also trying to do on the ground in China today together with our friends of, of the chamber there is to work out the differences within the Chinese economy because there's also debate there and to show that the provinces in which they do a lot of the things we don't like, subsidies, uh, state aid, uh, enormous power of the state on the enterprises, yeah. that it's not working and then recession. And in the provinces where they do more of the things we would find appropriate, so more private initiative, less of these things, this is where they produce the growth. Okay. And so all these things together, I think, can work. Uh, well, if at the end all, all players at least uh, uh, behave, let's say, at least half rational. Okay. Um, any burning points from all of you before we try to draw, in, draw some conclusions from this panel? Can I ask you, sir, to please introduce yourself and please be brief because we don't have much time. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. Well, Christophe Journet, uh, I'm a French journalist. And in France, we are lacking more and more steel industry since a few years. We still have, thanks to a few groups. Actually, my question would be, I really wonder if Europe has got a real strategy for steel. Because if you look, Donald Trump is playing poker. He's a street warrior. Xi Jinping is playing Go. He's a very good player. In Russia, they play chess, perhaps. And here we just play a kind of district football, something very nice to look at with women also. That's a great advantage for us. But where is the strategy? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, and I want to link that to my last question then. So, whether you agree that, that we're playing, I like the expression district football, uh, while they're playing in the major leagues, if I can keep it within the football realm. Um, you can react to that, please, as part of your answer. Whoops, I'm now trying to break the mics, but never mind. Um, I just want to, as I mentioned earlier, of course, the new EU leadership te team taking office. And for each of you, going back to where we started, when Geert said, we need the words to become actions. And you said, we've got the words. We're doing the right things on paper, or we're talking about doing the right things, but we need to do more of them and faster, and we need to wake up. There, is it the right or wrong strategy for each of you? If you had one message for the new EU leadership team, and I'll start with you, Luke, and go around that way, because I started this end with the first question. One thing that you want the new EU leadership team to do above all to address these challenges and help this sector still seize the opportunities, what would it be? Only one. One because okay. they will say, what do you want no, me no, to but do? Then I have a one A, one B and one C. So, um, <laughs> as long as you do it in one minute, that's fine. No problem. Um, level playing field. Europe must use its power to create a level playing field in our international relations and in our international trade. Uh, and that means also on energy policies, on decarbonization, uh, on, um, on, uh, on all the topics that we discussed uh, this afternoon. S secondly, from my point of view as a European trade union, we need to make sure that all these transformations are linked to social acceptance and to a strong social agenda. If not, we go to trouble in Europe in the next decade, in the next de two decades, that's second. And thirdly, for an industrial strategy, we need to focus on our strategic value chains uh, and also the value change of the technology of, the, of tomorrow uh, and make sure that we have them in Europe anchored and that they are there. And in okay. that sense, all this, of most of this value change, we need steel and we need European steel. We cannot depend for our economy of tomorrow on import okay. of steel. And to address the question from, from our French journalist colleague, those are the three key elements. Do you believe in those areas? We're on the right track and just need to do more, well, or we need to do something different? We are not China, where one person can decide for a whole uh, continent. Uh, we are Europe, and that means we do not have an easy structure to deal with. But on the other hand, we can create ownership in all regions of Europe by having 28 uh, member states around one table. But it needs to uh, lead to action. And in that sense, I started by saying we have a lot of plans. We are good in planning but we need action, and that needs to be owned by our okay. member states. Maria, are we on the right track, and what's your top priority for the coming? Allow me to start. The other way around. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that the first priority is to reduce energy cost. 
And the only way that we can manage it is finally to have much more cheap industry coming from renewables. According to a McKinsey report, which has been published by the end of this year, technology is an accelerator for renewables to, to give us cheaper energy. And secondly, we have to invest in our advantages. I mean, for example, steel sector has to meet very high level of European standards. And this is a... a, a, a a, advantage, a competitive advantage is not a disadvantage, and that's why we have to invest on it. Of course, we're not doing enough to have a coherent and holistic approach on our strategy for, for the industry, but we are trying to do our best, and we have, first of all, to start at the regional okay. level, and then to a member state level, and finally to a EU level. Thank you very much. Doug? Um, I, well, I guess the, the general point, longer term, I think we need to make sure that the, the strategy does indeed you know, foster investment in innovation and skills, and I think that's very important. The other, though, the more immediate priority, I guess, would be to try somehow to get rid of the trade distortions affecting the steel market, and, and ideally be able to persuade you know, China and the US to change their policy. Failing that, I guess, we need to look at how the EU can achieve a level playing field by what it does itself. Thank you very much. Marcus? Well, I mean, uh, I, I'm a bit like Luke, so I have one, but one A, one B. But the, but the headline is we need a more strategic and assertive approach to industry policy, and then you have all the sublines. I mean, we need to reverse the trend on the single market. We didn't mention this because we are on the way to more inter-European protectionism. We need to change, I mean, improve our trade policy, offensive on the one side, but not naive and assertive on the other side. We will need to do more in innovation. Uh, we, we have done more, but it's still not enough if you look at the global figures and, and if you look at what the Chinese are doing and catching up, so we'll need to do more there and, and we'll need to be more assertive. To answer the question, of course, we will need the incoming presidents and the institutions, but we'll also need the member states. Yeah. So, so we have talked about what can we do in trade policy and I've outlined on a couple of things, uh, but, but I mean, let's face it, uh, we are in a world now which is a bit going in the direction of managed trade which is not our world and we cannot really deal with it. The US are better in dealing with it and the Chinese are better. So what we need to make sure is that we are not going in this direction. One possibility is to, to have many followers. I mean, we did Japan, we did Canada. We're about to, in a possibility to conclude with Mercosur, more than 260 million people. But then, and then answering your question because it came from France, yeah then we must not block such an opportunity for understandable but relatively limited uh, specific interests. Then we need to really think about the strategic and where is the possibilities. We can, let's, let's, let's say it, we can be the leaders in the, in the rational and, and rule-based world because then we have a chance to maintain partly the world in which we can strive. Thank you. We'll come back on many of those points in our last discussion. And Roland, lastly to you, the Eurofair manifesto ahead of the European elections talked about innovate, trade, sustain and upskill. We've touched on all of those. For you, the most important priority, the clearest message you want to send to the new EU leadership about what they need to do. Relatively simple. The, um, the clearest message is that we are one of the biggest contributors to CO2 pollution. As a result, we are the ideal partner to partner with for the uh, Commission to actually um, bring the overall uh, CO2 footprint of the EU down. But in order to do that, and we happily partner with that, and we have the ability, we need to have the profitability. And um, we need to be kept out of the wind in order to be able to invest in innovation, in decarbonisation. Until we dare, um, we need help. And it's a little bit... What I, the, the feeling I get in this discussion is um, when you listen to the policymakers, they discuss the new hospital, but they're forgetting to buy the oxygen for the patient that is in the old hospital. And that is where we are. So there has to be something that, that um, supports the steel industry to enable us to be the partner to decarbonize. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed. Thank you so much to you all. Apologies. I should say, ladies and gentlemen, it may be hot out there, but you won't believe how hot it is under these lights. So thank you very much for enduring the heat. Um, good to see you, Marcus, and thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed.
great discussion. Now, we're going to have a second panel in a moment, and we're going to come back on this central question uh, of trade. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I've got something rather special to show you. And I'm told that what you are about to see has never been done in the Concert Nobler before. And it's certainly something I've not seen at any event I moderate, and I moderate a good few. So if I could ask you, please, to look upwards towards the dome instead of at the screens, and let's watch that show. The future. It's tomorrow. It's today. It's steel. The European steel industry is preparing its transition to the world of tomorrow. We're working hard to create new technologies and processes to make steel even cleaner to make. Our transition to the future will make steel even greener, with even wider applications than we could have ever imagined. Look at what we've already achieved. Vast cuts to CO2 emissions and energy use. Thousands of new ways of working and deploying steels. But to advance further, we need to work together. The steel industry, synergistic sectors, governments, the people. To lay the foundations for future successes in policies as wide as innovation, international trade, social integration, and regulation. As the new European mandate begins, there is more work than ever to be done to set the right priorities and achieve our goals. Our transition starts today. European Steel. The future. I told you it was cool. I really, really like that. Uh, very, very clever use of the room uh, and a little bit different. Um, we now come to our second policy roundtable. We're going to talk about trade policy within a renewed EU industrial strategy. And just to remind you that that strategy uh, in 2017 included initiatives for, and I quote, a balanced and progressive trade policy. The communication on steel we've already talked about in 2016 contained measures aimed at ensuring that steel can compete fairly on world markets. And when we come to that issue of excess capacity, uh, Trade Commissioner Margaret Wallstrom said last year after a meeting of the Global Forum, and I'm, I'm quoting her here, excess capacity has strained trade relations and the global trading architecture to breaking point. So if we are at breaking point, what do we need to do? Let me bring up our panelists and please do come and join me as I introduce you. Christopher Boyman, who is Senior Advisor at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. A very warm welcome to you. Mario Calgonazzo, who is CEO of the steelmaker Arvedi and Vice President of Federacci, the Federation of Italian Steel Companies. Welcome uh, to you. Jonathan Holslag, Professor of International Politics at the Free University of Brussels. A very warm welcome to you, Jonathan. And Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, MEP, who was a member of the who is over there getting her microphone on uh, and will be with us in just a moment. She was a member of the Industry Research and Energy Committee in the last European Parliament. Um, the other speaker mentioned in your programs, Massimiliano Salini, MEP, unfortunately uh, couldn't be with us. Um, so we have heard, and we'll, we'll, um, she, she will join us, Mia Petra will join us as soon as she is mic'd up. And could I just say before we start, it is very hot under these lights. If that makes you feel you really need to take your jacket off, many people have, please do. If you need water, I have it here. I don't want anyone fading away under these very hot lights this afternoon. So a very warm welcome to you, Mia Petra. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, let's have it. It's, a, it's a, the gentleman taking their jackets off because it's so, so hot here today. So we're going to dive straight in. Um, and, and Christopher, um, if I could, in terms of, of the role of trade policy, I, I gave that quote, and it was a central element of the industrial strategy, and that was before things got the way they are now, in terms of the world trade environment. Let me grab that for you. I'll move it in a second. Oops. Oh, hang on. Your clip to it. Your button was there. There we go. It's off. Um, in terms of the, the role that it plays in the industrial strategy, is it given the prominence it deserves? And... How do you see the current state of play in relation to the impact this is having on the steel sector? 
my, my view is that there are two trade policies to worry about. There's the trade policy of the existing industry. We've heard a lot about Trump and Turkey and China. And that should be dealable with their contingent problems, which have been badly handled and which need sorting in the short term to help the industry. I'm more interested today in trade policy on climate change, which is the new agenda for the industrial strategy. And of all the elements of the industrial strategy that concern the steel industry, it is climate change because steel is a carbon intensive industry. And it's impossible to imagine a future of 2050 with a carbon intensive steel industry, at least very hard. And so I think that the aim, the constructive aim of today, in my view, is to disconnect the short term noise about trade policy, which is a bit of a nightmare, from the long term objective under a new commission of creating a trade policy which takes account of the need of breakthrough technologies, which allows, which facilitates not just R&D, but deployment. R&D is relatively easy. It, the, the numbers involved are quite small compared with the turnover of the industry. It's deployment, if you imagine that 20 of Arcelor Mittal's blast furnaces have to be redone, ditto ThyssenKrupp, ditto Liberty, ditto Salzgitter, etc. Huge investments to create a higher cost industry. I think that wasn't emphasized enough this morning. The aim of decarbonizing the industry, it'd be great if it was going to create a low cost industry. We know we're aiming to create a higher cost industry, higher capital cost, probably, higher op operating costs almost certainly. To do that within existing trade policy is probably impossible. We need a strategic new trade policy. Thank you very much. So a strategic new trade policy, and we also talked, and I'd like to get your views later, on um, the ETS and, and the future of that and this talk we, we had about yeah. exporting it and how that would work. Um, struck, though, by your comment about disconnecting the short-term uh, noise about trade policy, whether that is impossible at the moment to disconnect the two. Um, but Mario Caldonazzo, from your perspective, um, the centrality of, of trade policy for the EU now, how do you see the current state of play uh, and what the EU is doing and whether it is enough? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a man of industry, so I would like to give you my perspective working in a company, working uh, in, uh, as I said, in the, in the industry. Our industry has a big challenge in front. First of all, because wants to be part of the uh, European strategy for an economy clean, modern and fair. So we want to participate building an industry strong, based on innovation, production growth, deep, transformation driven by digitalization and other modern technologies. We have to follow as well the development and the growth of our customers facing big challenges. As an example, the electrification for our key customer, which is the automotive industry. Then we have to face the challenge of decarbonization and also increasing cost of energy and a significant cost of manpower. What I'm trying to say is that we cannot face this big challenge without the support of a strong trade policy. What I mean by strong trade policy is a policy which is really focused on the central issue, which is industry. This is the main point. Cannot always and only be the end user, the focus. The focus must be also industry, because we need to face this challenge in a very strong position. And to do that, we have to face very important and significant cost, billions of investments. Can I so, just ask, when you say that, is your feeling that to date trade policy has been too focused on the end user, on the consumer, my, and not on industry today? This is my feeling. I, want to man, I, I don't want to mention what uh, uh, the, the, the Trump administration did with the Section 232. I don't want to to take it as an example because I don't believe it is. 
But in this case, if you consider these measures as a measure of uh, uh, industrial and economic policy, the reason of that is to give the chance to the steel industry to earn money and to invest this yeah. money into a modernization. So in this case, right or wrong, uh, trade policy was also an economic uh, decision. Yeah. Okay. Our decision, our focus in Europe is end user, is not industry. Okay. So we want a more balanced. We are not asking for any kind of protectionism. We are against the protectionism. We are for a free market, but we want a level okay. playing field. Okay, come back on that and how we achieve that level playing field uh, in a little while. But Mia Petra um, talked here about disconnecting from the short term noise. There's an awful lot of it, and it's very loud at the moment. Um, how do you see the current state of play and the EU's response to this changing world? It's very stuck. Marcus Beira was talking in the last session about the old world as we knew it is fading. And two examples he gave of that was US protectionism and Chinese assertiveness. Um, and there was a suggestion in our last panel, we're not waking up to that. Do you think we are when it comes to trade policy? Or do we have to think uh, really hard about the approach we take now and change it quite fundamentally? Yes and no. <laughs> I, I, yes, I think we have been uh, opening our eyes, or uh, I, I can maybe evaluate that we have been blue-eyed for the open trade policy, for the always uh, willing to open more markets, and, and uh, not questioning on what the other partner is doing. So I, I can uh, underline this uh, level playing field is not happening at the moment on the trade policy. But at the same time, I would love to see Europe also to be the one who will build its future on the multi-functioning uh, systems and agreements as far as the companions, uh, and I would like to say also the uh, on the US and Japan, I would love to see them on the same side with the EU, and then also that way um, to then uh, create a level playing field with the China. So if this is other steps, I would first concentrate really the US to lift the tariffs and, uh, and then uh, find something on the TTIP, which is now evolving again. But uh, my uh, other idea is also that, uh, as was mentioned here, that the strategic uh, trade policy is needed, more strategic. Uh, I would combine it, it with a more strategic industrial policy. And they go hand in hand, as we have seen, that do we have the European industrial and trade strategy that will bring us to the next uh, uh, modernized uh, industry also in the steel sector. And I very much understand that the uh, burden of the climate change actions is on the industry. It's heavy and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, demands to compensate or to look at from the politics uh, is understandable. But at the same time, I see that the forerunners go fastest. So we, we need uh, to look the whole industrial side that we are the source of innovations. We are the uh, home for the next innovative uh, non-polluting uh, steel. As mm -hmm. we have now seen that there are uh, trials to make produce steel with okay. uh, eco-friendly uh, and climate friendly. So uh, I would put these all together, sustainable and uh, uh, environmental social rights and then build level playing field on that. But I do not see a future for the industry that is not investing all the time and make it uh, the modern way. And then what the political okay. uh, life, what we can do from the policy side, it is uh, try to build for more markets as well. Okay, and so that is also not only to talk about this, but open new markets, even the Mercosur is Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing there. you all making that plea for a more strategic approach uh, broadly to industrial policy, but specifically to this. Uh, we'll come back on what that strategic approach might look like in a moment. But Jonathan, um, we live in tough trade times. Uh, we heard a lot about the impact from here to right at the beginning about the impact of what the US has done on Europe, on that surge in European imports in this industry. Um, the EU has responded overall. How would you assess uh, current EU trade policy in terms of supporting that industrial strategy? A bit like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> uh, it's true, of course, that we all feel annoyed that the world order is unraveling. 
it was our little baby. We created it after uh, World War II, and many of the rules that were set in the WTO framework were, were ours. But I would say get used to it, uh, because what we are seeing in terms of unraveling of the global trade order, it's not the vanguard, it's the beginning. It's a reflection of a world order that is inherently more, uh, let's say, multipolar, uh, with, 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 with uh, different players fighting against one another for economic and strategic influence. It won't come back. Uh, and I think it's indeed very noble for the European Union to continue to try to invest in uh, reigniting the World Trade Organization. Uh, but for me, honestly and frankly, the chance that it's going to fly is very small. So I think what we need is a two-track policy. On the one hand, of course, we have to continue in the next few years to engage in dialogues about rebalancing the WTO so as um, to avoid that it continues to be uh, predated almost. Uh, by uh, free riders like, uh, like China. Yet, on the other hand, we also have to work towards um, a trade strategy that anticipates a world order with less multilateralism. And then I think the ultimate choice is between is this going to be um, a protectionist trade slash industrial policy or is it going to be progressive in a sense that we use trade and, and industrial incentives to grow more sustainable, to grow more efficient, uh, all these goals that were um, already put forward by the three previous speakers. Mm -hmm. What we have to have, I think, in, in essence, to make that progressive trade policy work, is not so much strategy, it's, it's guts. It's guts, it's courage. It's the courage to basically tie the standards that we uh, apply domestically in terms of CO2, sustainability, the ambitions that we have towards circularity, to external trade. As long as we uh, do not have the guts to basically um, um, uh, reconcile the internal standards with external trade, we are going to continue to have reverse discrimination. We're going to be discriminating against our own companies in a global market, and that must stop. But it requires courage, because you still have a generation of bureaucrats and politicians who believe that the main goal is to save multilateralism. I think one has to understand that multilateralism is a means, it's not an end. The main end is to preserve prosperity, uh, and that is to cre give opportunities to sectors okay. like steel to be, uh, be innovative. Okay. Reactions to that, if you would, and in terms of this more strategic approach, and you're saying one key element of that is to say, okay, the world has changed and we're not going back to the old way, for now anyway. We have to accept and anticipate that reality and work with it. Uh, what does this new, more strategic approach look like for the rest of you? Jonathan's outlined his vision. Ma Petra, yeah. Um, uh, it is all, uh, to have a common strategy that where we want to go, like the aim, and I like very much also saying that it's not the aim to be multi-partner, it's the aim to do the better world, uh, and then well, how, how to, to reach there. Maybe we have one lack in the trade policies that we, uh, and in our single markets everywhere, that we, when we look at the end product, we don't look how it is done, we look what is the, the end uh, result of it. Because uh, I think for Europeans, after the elections also, we see that the environmental aspect is the uh, will of the Europeans, mm -hmm. as the climate is also paramount that we cannot avoid, uh, and then also the social rights. That's why we want to keep the European industries alive to get the jobs and get the decent jobs. So then uh, to putting that as a strategy, that how then the, to be able to do that so we cannot avoid also looking in this mandate for the some border adjustment mechanisms that we also, when we have rules for the products in the European markets, we have uh, also rules that apply for imported uh, materials. And then I would also look back that how the products have been produced, not only what is produced. Mm -hmm. If we get these parts, uh, anywhere in the, the coming uh, trade agreements, we are building a level playing field. Quick one, if you would, and then I'll come yeah, to you. Very, Mario. very quickly, what you say, I think, is, is, is very important and critical. But what we have been really lacking is uh, then also an administration that is ready to face with some of the retaliations. Because if we are going to tie internal standards to external trade, you can be pretty sure that you're going to have like a, a bucket load of retaliations coming from all kind of countries, developing countries, China, of course, the United, United States. So I think handling the transition is going to be, uh, uh, be quite a challenging exercise. What we do and what we have been doing, I fear, in the last five years, essentially, is to shy away from that dilemma, rather to 
ignore yeah. it, to pretend that it's not there. Uh, but if we don't take it head on in the next uh, term, I think the, 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 the blow that will be dealt to our industry and particularly steel uh, is going to be, um, I think, disastrous. Thank you. I want to come back in a little while to the level playing field and specifically what we need to do in that mar area, Mario. But in terms of this more strategic approach to our tra trade agenda that they've been appealing for, does that resonate with you? Would you agree with it? Uh, yeah, and if no. you do, how do what are the key elements of... Yeah. What I, <clears throat> I think that, uh, again, I'm, I'm a man of industry, I'm not a politician, I'm not a professor. What I would like to see is, first of all, a clear, a clear strategy mm. of, uh, um, from uh, the European Union regarding economy and regarding industry. Today, in this uh, European Speed Day, our chairman asked us, actually, but do you want a steel industry in Europe or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. We are doubtful today yeah. if there will be a, a steel industry in the future in Europe or not, because the signals we received are not clear at all. So what is clear is that we have to decarbonize by 2050, but already by 2030 achieve very, very strict and severe results. Uh, we have uh, to, 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 to innovate, we have to do many things. But on the other hand, when we ask a level play field, the answers are very weak. Yes. Answers are very weak. So this is a matter also of uh, coherence and consistency from the European Union. Why do you want all of these achievements to be done by the European in the industries and not by the others. This is something we do not understand. So again, trade policy within clear rules must be used also to give consistency to a more strategic vision of the European economy and of the European industry. So Mario, you are skeptical when the EU talks that it has for the last few years about this goal of getting back to 20% of the economy being industry, when it can be balancing the economy, you're saying, yeah, but when you face the, the direct question, do you want this sector to survive? Yeah. You don't get a clear answer. I don't think so. Personally, I think we do not have a clear answer of it. Sure. Because if the answer is there are four, 425 million tons of over, over, over capacity in the, in the world, why do we have to produce steel in Europe? instead of importing from other yeah. countries, independently from if they respect emissions, if they respect the, the work rights, if they respect... I don't have a clear answer yet, okay. honestly. Okay, thank you. Um, the strategic vision for our trade yeah. policy, Christopher, what for you are the key elements of such a vision? And then I want to come back to the level playing field, and I do want to talk briefly about Section 232. I know you don't, but I would like to just come back on the EU's response and what we learn from what's happened so far, but well, more of this stra strategic the, vision the strategic first. strategic vision, there are three, there are 11 energy intensive sectors who are having discussions today in Europe. Three of those, steel, cement, and chemicals, are the ones that are really known as hard to obey sectors. And I believe that there's been a failure to address what is needed in these sectors to get to breakthroughs. And this is where the EU ETS has obviously failed dismally. It may have succeeded in reducing emissions overall, but if you think it's been going for 15 plus years, it's only in the last two or three years that we really see serious initiatives by the industry to decarbonize, to, to invest in R&D to decarbonize. So for the first 10 years, the ETS was just a battleground of squabbles in Brussels. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't seen as a means to decarbonize the industry. So when we talk about um, this future, we talk about the role of trade within uh, yeah. tackling these issues. Luke, in, uh, Luke Triander in the last session uh, said we need to export the ETS. We need to, through other countries, through our trade agreements. What does this mean? Do you, would you agree with well, that and how do we do it? Well, I think we need to export climate policy, whether we export ETS. How though? Because we tried to do it, the EU well, tried to do it by saying we lead, others will follow, but that hasn't necessarily happened. Well, we do, one of the few successes of recent years has been the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is alive and well, even with the US subverting it 
it's alive and well in most of the country, and the hotter it gets in New Delhi and Beijing, as well as Brussels, the more likely it is that the Paris Agreement will continue. The Paris Agreement is now the framework, and it's being ratcheted up with the IPCC report, to, for which we can cooperate. The two kinds of cooperation are needed. The cooperation here in Brussels between the industry and, and the Commission and, of course, national governments, which is not done well. And there's corporate, international cooperation. If, I agree. I think we all agree if it's only Europe, that's hopeless. Europe needs to take the lead but have followers or colleagues in doing that. Okay. Just on this question of, of you said uh, earlier, Mia Petra, we've been a bit blue-eyed. Uh, and the word naivety has been floating around in the ether. And I'm just wondering, and I do want just using this as an example of whether you see it as such, the US Section 232 and the EU's response, which controversially for this sector included this element of relaxation. So you raise the quotas even though demand has not gone up and therefore they say you're actually exacerbating the problem uh, and they've called it absurd at times. Now, is that an example, do you think, of where we have the EU's response has been measured and calibrated and not blue-eyed or do we draw lessons from that about how to respond if we live in a world that will inevitably be less multilateral, more protectionist, how do we respond? I don't want to comment that uh, straight, but I was thinking also that do we have a strategic industrial and trade policy as we now are learning more and more that China is very strategic. When yeah. it goes out, it's very strategic. When it uh, sets rules to its own markets, it's very strategic. There's a Trans technology transfer and the requirements they do, it's very strategic. So in that sense, we have been blue-eyed. Oh. But when I, I also think that uh, we are setting double standards sometimes, uh, that we have certain rules for the European uh, products, and at the same time we allow other countries to produce them and bring it in some uh, chemicals, sure. for example, uh, that we say no for the European industries to do it or use it, but at the same time it's not uh, forbidden to uh, other to use it and bring it to our markets. So this kind of double standard is saying it's not good legislation. Do you think we've but been blue-eyed or have we just been, I mean, as you say, we really need to rethink because the world and the multilateral order uh, is under challenge. Are we blue-eyed or just not being anticipatory no, enough? Uh, it's even worse. We have been opportunistic. Uh, we have been opportunistic and we have been not blue-eyed, we have been shutting our eyes to, to what happened all around us. I think the very fact of decarbonization is a case in point. We expect our, co our companies, our steel companies, to decarbonize. And many of them are in the forefront, are investing in research and development, are churning out like a lot of very important innovations. But at the end of the day, the result of this pro-consumer trade policy is that if you have a consumer, being it a government, being it another company, being it whatever, and they have to, 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 to make the choice between decarbonized steel, which is nice and, 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 and clean, and on the other hand, the dumped excess from China or Turkey or any other place, they, they make their choice. Uh, we have had a very good example in our country, which basically uh, uh, wants to be a, a sort of both an industrial leader and an environmental leader. It doesn't work very well, but they had to buy um, uh, uh, doors for a lock in Antwerp. And we had like uh, local competitors who could make those doors uh, very expensive stuff uh, in a much more sustainable, ba uh, sustainable way. At the end of the day, they were shipped in from China. Imagine the pollution from the barge, from the ship, from, from, from everything. So I, I think if you go for decarbonization, the main asset, the main lever is the internal market. That's now 500 uh, million citizens, um, perhaps after Brexit a bit less, uh, but it's still significant. Um, just make sure that you shut the door to any entity that pursues dumping, being it social dumping, environmental dumping, financial dumping, because otherwise you drive your companies into exhaustion. And the downside of a pro-consumer trade policy for me is very obvious. It's importing deflation, uh, it's propping up um, uh, purchasing power by getting things in cheap, but uh, in the long run, purchasing power is not determined by cheap imports, it's determined by productivity. And if then you do not create this enabling environment for the steel industry to be sustainable, to be innovative, to continue to hire, uh, hire people, you're digging okay. your own economic grave. So really very much echoing, Mario, your point about we need a much greater focus, not just always on the end user, uh, but on industry, but on the question of 
American protectionism, Chinese assertiveness and so on. Do you think the EU is being naive uh, or is it trying to strike a balance and just not quite getting it right? What's, what's your assessment? <clears throat> Clearly, the, once again, I don't want to judge if right or wrong, but Section 232 is, was a clear decision was a decision in favor of the industry, but not to uh, just protect the industry. It was a, it was a way to give, uh, uh, is a way to give money to the steel industry, obliging the steel industry to invest this profit in the modernization. Mm. Right or wrong, it is a decision. It is attack. Europe is defense. What we did, safeguard. Safeguard to avoid deflection. Was, it was a decision just to defend. What we would like to see is a different approach. Is approach of consistency. We want the steel industry to decarbonize by 2030, 2050. Okay, we have to give the steel industry the best environment to do it. So, avoiding market distortion. I'm not talking about protectionism. Sure. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about defending our free market uh, through a appropriate uh, trade, uh, uh, trade uh, measures, defense measures. Second point, yes, I believe that we have in Europe a wrong perception of the, uh, uh, of the crucial point of the end user because End user means cheap price, mm. but it is the only the goal of the end user to have a cheap price. Don't we believe that it is important rather to develop more an optic and strategy of supply chain? Mm. What is the content, strategic content of a strong relationship between a domestic steel industry and uh, and, uh, and, the, and the European customer. These are the points. What uh, and how much the steel industry spent to support uh, its customers' uh, development. Again, electrification, but not only, many, many sectors. This has a value. We cannot destroy this value. This is what I, my, the, the, so. Christopher, a reaction from you, and then I'm coming out to the room. Well, I think that the customers are, have, are crucial here. And I would like to have a new institution or a new system where the customers were properly represented and could say their piece and was unassailable, by which I mean that customers' interests will be taken into account of, which they supposedly are in trade policy. They'd be taken account of in environmental policy as well. If we could get I mean, there's a sense in which the WTO did for a time achieve a, a basis of being an unchallengeable organization. It may have gone now, but it did achieve that and gap before that. If we could create a system in Europe as strong as that, where the customers had a say, the producers had a say, and it was argued and there was a disputes panel, and we could achieve objectivity, that really would be my aim. And we don't have anything like that today. Thank you very much indeed. Just going to go out to the room and see if there are any questions or comments to what you are hearing before we continue our discussion. Everybody's just going, oh, it's very hot in here. We know, but you'll get a reward after some very nice cold drinks, I promise. Thank you, sir. And please introduce yourself. My name is Veysel Yayan. I am Secretary General of Turkish Steel Producers Association. During the statement of Mr. Chairman of Eurofair and this panelist very many times mentioned to Turkey as a dumping, uh, the, and they mentioned to Turkey with the China, but our position is quite different than China. During the last 10 years period, we gave deficit $12 billion to European Union in steel sector. Only just last two years there has been difference. The other years, European producers export to Turkey two times more, three times more from time to time. And our 
free trade agreement forbidden any single penny to Turkish steel sectors. Oh, the Turkish steel sector do not have any government aid. There is no any state-owned company. We are not okay. dumping. Briefly, sir, sorry. Yeah, if you were, very, yeah. very brief. Under these conditions, we believe that Turkey has uh, the, the right to be uh, specified in different category, not, uh, not with the China. Because, for, for example, in this very year... Very briefly now, very sorry, brief, yeah. This year, the European Union export to Turkish market in flat still has been increased 120%. Okay. Our export decreased okay. 100%. So you're saying don't put us in the same category? It's a very With different situation. China, we are totally okay. different. Thank you very Thank much you so for much. making that point. Thank you, sir. I'm going to come over here. I see it. just the one or both of you? Just the one. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Enrico Gibellieri, expert of steel. I, would, uh, I put the question and I give an information. The question is, uh, a part of the introduction from Mr. Paul Ward, only the, um, the CEO of Autocumpu referred to the borders uh, um, adjustment measures, border remedies. I think that in the context that you described in your panel, this could be one possible instrument in the transition because this is uh, to establish a level play field sure. by one very powerful means based on the CO2 content of the products imported and exported from Europe. This can also uh, function together with ETS because, you know, to restart discussing, we just ended now the revision of the ETS, to restart discussing it takes time, but the border remedies can be can be a very strong, uh, uh, very strong okay. instrument. Thank you very In much. In the Economic and Social Committee, we have produced a document with a clear proposal on a possible simple system to establish this. Thank you very much. I'll get the panel to react in a moment. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I see one over here. Excuse me, just have to climb around the furniture slightly to get to you. Thank you, sir. There we go. I would like to make a contribution. Could you introduce yourself? Uh, Franz Hutzenberger, ArcelorMittal. Hello. I would like to make a comment on the European partnership, proposed partnership, clean steel, low carbon steel making. It's a story that was started in uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, at, Euro, at Eurofair, so the European Steel Producers Association. We proposed a um, partnership on steel for uh, boosting the introduction of this steel making technologies that should help us in the future to reduce the CO2 emission reductions. The Commission told us, look, um, a sector specific activity in Horizon Europe, it's difficult to manage, we cannot do it, but we have a proposal to you. You have your own fund for uh, the ECSC, so you could use a little bit of money from there and put it together and then you have the partnership. So this proposal is now on the table in order to be accepted, maybe hopefully tomorrow in the meeting. On the other hand, in order to make this uh, really the truth of the future, we need an unanimous agreement in order to modify a European Council decision. Okay. So please uh, give us a chance in this manner. Okay, thank you very much. Not directly related to the topic of this panel, but we hear your voice and I'm sure it is heard by the policymakers in the room. Um, Jonathan, um, can you pick up on this point about border remedies? I absolutely agree. When at the beginning I said that there is a difference to be made between protectionism and progressive trade that creates a playing field for the steel industry to go beyond and to become more sustainable, uh, I think these adjustments uh, are, are uh, indispensable and they have to be applied on both the shipping, which, which I think is a, is a critical uh, aspect uh, and that will already help level the playing field, but also on the product as such. Uh, at this moment, we have what I call reverse discrimination. Uh, we impose a lot of standards on producers who want to stay here and survive and contribute to the prosperity of uh, European citizens. Uh, but on the other hand, we allow uh, to, to, to have unleashed at them this, this kind of cascade of heavily polluting steel coming mostly uh, from, 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 from the east. And I agree with you that Turkey is not exactly in the same category as, uh, as China. This is enlightened economic statecraft. 
but as I said, it requires guts. First of all, in the WTO, it continues to be very, very complex. You have uh, bureaucrats there who say you can do it. You have others, the hard-nosed neoliberals, who say forget it because that basically blows up the whole multilateral uh, framework. And then you have the Chinese and the Indians and the Americans saying if you do that, we will go after some of yep. the industries that are present and invested on, uh, in our markets. That, that was exactly my point about disconnecting. If we allow the border tax adjustment thing, which I think all experts who've looked at it support in principle, to get overwhelmed by the short-term politics of trade, yeah. then there's nothing will happen and we can't achieve this. That's, that's why we need to disconnect. We need a system which the Chinese, the Indians, the Turks, everyone will buy into, not one that is yet another source of argument and controversy. Mario, did you want to come in on either of those points from the room? Of course, uh, we are fully supportive regarding the border adjustment. Uh, <coughs> it is uh, indispensable, uh, absolutely necessary to, to level uh, the, the play field. And regarding Turkey, okay, Turkey is not like China, but Turkey is far away from uh, the constraint and the commitments uh, the European uh, industry took and uh, far away and in any case it is part of a very very unusual behavior if uh, just you if you look at the hot roll cars what happened uh, despite of safeguards uh, uh, um, it, it, it was the clearest uh, case of deflection when 232 raised the tariff by 50 percent because it was doubled uh, for Turkey we experienced uh, in Italy I don't remember if it two or three times import uh, compared to 2018. And if you look at uh, the case of Italy, which is my country, all these flows of steel from, uh, from Turkey were at a very low price, which destroyed our local market. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yes, uh, I, I mentioned it briefly, the border assessment mechanism, but now I have to bring my nationality. I'm from Finland and we have a new government and taking the presidency of the council Indeed. in one week time. But at home in their own program, a government program agreed by uh, different parties, they have mentioning also the look at this issue and my very good friend trade minister Virle Skinnari I'm very sure will work on this on the European level it's not short time uh, goals it's something that we need to develop and, and get started and I'm happy also to remind that in the parliament last term in ITRE committee we had uh, Edouard Martin from France, Patricia Toya from Italy, we had uh, uh, British uh, colleagues and uh, I was there to actively like looking after that it's to wake up call for our open trade policy only to protect our steel workers. But I also like very much the question that if you ask that why to produce steel in Europe if it's like too much, if it's elsewhere cheaper and if it's climate friendly and if it fulfills the social criteria then I think that the trade policy should allow it then happen, that of course there needs to be competition that the politicians cannot say. So, but it, it, there is a big but. Is it environmental friendly? Is it social justice? Is it taking care of the environment? So of course we try to set global standards that everywhere, everyone will produce the steel of the way it doesn't harm the climate. But my truth uh, uh, and belief is that we need to make the first uh, um, uh, first of the kind industrial innovations in here and also the commenting the question there yes uh, low carbon streets uh, steel uh, partnership in the horizon is important we have other tools the project company and European interest ETS innovation fund state aid rules to be watched so there are many legislative tools and not to mention the energy supply and the price of the energy how we will take this okay. transition Thank you, Jonathan. You wanted to come in. Yeah, very brief, briefly, I think the, the situation is a bit more complex than that. Of course, the main aim should be to engender this new industrial revolution that is more sustainable, including the steel industry. But part of the global trade problem is that increasingly shifting from basic polluting stuff towards more high-end, cleaner stuff, you have some of the competitors that deliberately create overcapacity. Um, and, and, and then indeed if we continue to say, yeah, but there is already too much from everything in the world, why, 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 why do we uh, turn, let's say, a bit more defensive on that? I think it's, 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 um, 
self-defeating policy. Uh, it is unfortunately the case that deliberately creating overcapacity and to basically exhaust your rivals in, 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 in oversupply, low prices and so forth, it's, it's part of Chinese industrial strategy. It has been part of Chinese, uh, sorry, South Korean industrial um, strategy. You cannot continue to tolerate, even if Chinese steel gets more sustainable, but still depends on export credit, on subsidies, on, on I don't know what else. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. So it has to be balanced. On the one hand, there, there should be this, envir this environmental uh, component, this environmental pillar. But on the other hand, I think there should also be a more realistic, um, in a political sense, pillar um, that departs from the fact that unfair competition as a result of state banks um, uh, giving en endless cre uh, credit lines, export credits being excessive, okay. that too must be stopped. Reactions to that? Otherwise, I want to, yeah, please, Chris. Well, uh, only just to go back to the opening Eurofair statement. The steel industry was doing quite well in 2017 and 18. Yeah. Don't let's forget that. So steel in crisis, which is all over my Financial Times three or four weeks ago, is a new event. And that's why I think we need to distinguish between the, the structural chronic issues and the short-term issues. China will always be a threat, but it's not always a threat. That would be my point. Any others? No. Um, I want to try now to draw some implications of all of this, as we did with the last panel when we were talking broadly about uh, industrial strategy and where we are. But in terms of the new EU leadership and the incoming team and the new parliament, uh, as we, we um, if you, for each of you, if you were trying to say, okay, the implications of all of this for the incoming leadership, the things they really need to think about, we'll come to your own personal priority later, but. Would you have any advice for them, Mario, as, as this new team take office and set their priorities for the next five years and their goals, what would you be saying to them now about what they need to do most of all? I would simply ask to consider the importance uh, of the industry uh, in our continent, uh, in our European Union. Industry, which means uh, culture, which means uh, social implications, uh, which means innovation, research, and uh, a, a broad uh, uh, involvement uh, of people. We cannot give up with our industry, and uh, industry, European industry, is strongly based uh, on the steel one. So. Uh, my advice, my request, my suggestion is to really replace uh, the steel and uh, overall uh, the European industry in the middle uh, of, uh, of your agenda. Thank you very much. Christopher. Well, I, I would like the new commission to focus more than it's done before on the hard to abate industries who've got specific problems and to say, to ensure that trade experts and competition experts and grow experts, industrial experts and R&D experts are working together, not working in silos. The trade and competition is all subordinate to what we actually need, particularly to decarbonize these hard to obey sectors. Thank you very much. I'll come to you last, Mia Petra, because this is sort of messages to the new leadership and the incoming political teams. Jonathan. Well, for me on trade, this commission at least was a commission of the missed opportunities. Uh, so I really hope that for the next commission, things would uh, become a little bit bolder. And if I were to make a single proposal, it's to start rolling out border adjustment by 2024. Together with external partners like China and the US and others, if possible, unilaterally, if, if necessary, we should not continue to shy away from, from, from this responsibility. I think that's the only way to progressively bend the challenge of overcapacity and unfair competition into an opportunity for the industries to move further uh, in sustainability and in, in innovation. And do you and believe so that can really happen, that we can turn it from a challenge into well, an opportunity? Don't, don't, we like to say it. Don't force me to, uh, to end <laughs> on a skeptical note. <laughs> uh, but you asked me if there is something that the Commission should do, whereas we're going to have the sort of courageous leadership and the kind of courageous uh, uh, commissioners um, that, that basically do not um, back away from tough matters in, uh, in trade, that remains to be seen. Uh, but if there is a single thing that um, the Commission can contribute uh, to the flourishing of steel and industry at large, 
is this. And then I think you have to have dedicated sector policies and innovation policies and so forth and so forth. But I think this is the best way to bend the challenge of fragmentation globally of um, economic nationalism and overcapacity into an opportunity for us to strike a good balance between, as you said, uh, what the youngsters demand and expect, being sustainability, and on the other hand, also what is macroeconomically necessary, that is to continue to boost productivity uh, in, a, in a responsible way. I mean, Petra, for you, as, as the new leadership team takes office in this really very difficult and challenging environment, particularly uh, in relation to trade above all else, what do you think, what would you be saying to people now about how this needs to fit into the overall priorities of, of, of the next commission? We had Juncker's famous 10 priorities. Does this need to be in some form in there? And if it does, what, what do we need to be doing, do you think? Yeah, we, at least we should be happy that we do have internal markets. <laughs> That's first of all, the, uh, 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 if you look at the elections, the political elections like a few months ago, it was not that sure that we will have this positive European Parliament and, and how positive uh, European uh, uh, governments we do have. I hear a lot of like sand in between the paper, as we say in Finnish, that not everybody is happy about having this internal market of 500 million people. So yes, we do have that so far. Uh, so then we can talk about this European industry and European steel, and then uh, how much then we can cooperate with the others with trade is a question. When I was like a little bit challenging that if the others are doing as well, how much can we make the pro uh, progressive uh, trade policy to be not protective? Uh, uh, the one uh, I was also strongly believing that we are doing the best and then we have to keep that. I uh, like the comment on the industry and hard as a culture as well, but of course it is a motivation for the Europeans to keep the jobs here. Mm. Uh, job creation is a part, but then also to believe that uh, when we do invest on the most modern one, we have the jobs here and not elsewhere. But then also, the, I, I would also call for the coherence that we do have so many tools, state aid, environment, uh, energy, uh, R&D, and also can we somewhat promote the use of environmentally produced steel? And what is the price of the end goods where they have used the good quality, uh, lifespan good quality steel or not? Do we have some uh, other than money talks uh, only in consumer And markets. can I turn the question on its head and also ask you in terms of, that's policy makers, but the industry itself, faced with these challenges, particularly this very tough trade environment uh, and this rise of protectionism and the impacts that Kit spelt out so graphically and dramatically at the beginning of this afternoon, do you have a piece of advice for them uh, on what they need to do in this environment, whether it be in relation to their dialogue with policymakers or more broadly, what they need to do in this really tough situation. Any thoughts from you all on that? I'll come to you last, Mario, because you can't give yourself advice. You can react to their advice. Anything you want or would advise industry to do, the industry to do? It's too much to advise industry straight, but um, I have followed some uh, uh, steel industry is taking the, not only the, pre, the producer from the like, steel as a raw material, uh, uh, but then go the next step and develop more steel products, uh, as you were mentioning, closer to the car industry and then make the innovations not to separate blocks, but then more the whole system. So why not also to bring more, more, more jobs also to do and produce steel products and find linkages. I cannot tell, if I could, I should work on the industry and not in the politics, but in, the, in many, many sectors there are these disruptive innovations which go when you put different uh, sectors to work to hand in hand, so maybe sometimes yeah. more in steel. Digitalization is the one, but then uh, something might come. Christopher, the implications of all of what you've been talking about and recommending for the steel industry as distinct from policy makers. <laughs> Well, the point I would like to make is that now it's out in the open. I would like to make an advertisement for the <laughs> ArcelorMittal Climate Action Report, May 2019. This is an excellent 35-page document, the best I've seen from the steel industry. I hope its competitors will follow, which really sets out a landscape and, of course, a lot of the things that that company is doing. And if everyone does that, then you begin to get a vision of what the future might be 
what the funding might be first for the R&D and secondly for the deployment. And Jonathan, in this world of an unravelling world order, uh, in this world of less multilateralism, um, what, do you, what would you advise the industry to do uh, in order to make sure its voice is heard um, and to play its part in meeting this challenge? Well, first of all, I don't think there is a reason to be defeated. Uh, the European steel industry, as far as I understand, is already one of the most innovative uh, globally. Uh, and, and that's something to, uh, to, be, to be proud of. Um, so it shouldn't be all gloom and doom. Uh, that said, uh, I think, in essence, uh, some things are to be learned from China. Uh, if I peruse the Chinese policy documents on the steel industry, what is stated again and again and again and again, that is that steel is a backbone industry, a strategic backbone industry, and if you lose steel, you lose the capability of growing another um, uh, panoply of uh, critical industries from defense over energy to, uh, to, to, to clean cities. Uh, uh, steel is a backbone industry and perhaps with, 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 with these arguments that the Chinese offer uh, at hand, you should go to the government and say, okay, see here, uh, uh, our, our main competitors put it black on white, why don't you get to see it? Uh, and that importing cheap goods is fine only for a while. It's fine only as long as you um, prop up and keep up your productivity uh, in the industries. Once that goes down and you start losing backbone industries like, like yeah. steel, purchasing power will follow very soon. But Mario, that, that's the message you've been trying to give yes, them. Perfect, uh, per perfectly sum up. <laughs> <laughs> so continue, keep hammering at that door, keep giving yes, that message. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our panel very much indeed. Thank you to you all. It, it only remains for me to thank your affair very much indeed, to thank Hirt uh, and the team. Uh, we've talked a lot about meeting challenges, but we've also talked a lot about making the most of opportunities, embracing that change, and try to identify what the industry is doing and why, how it is doing that and what support and help it needs. I know this conversation will go on and on, possibly over drinks now, uh, but thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to both our panelists and to our keynote speakers. Thank you to Eurofair for hosting us. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can stay, drinks will be served outside. A nice cold drink is probably what you need on an afternoon like this. Thank you all very much indeed. Nice to see you again. How are you? Are you well? Thank you so much.